broken, betrayed marriage, do you feel adrift or hopeless because you know the Bible has the answers, but you have no idea how to apply what you're reading? Hi, I'm Kim Pollan and welcome to the Hope for Spouses Lunchtime Live. Now, if this is your first time joining us, I want to offer you a special welcome and let you know that I started this ministry because my husband and I were separated due to four years of his serial adultery. Well, we were separated for four years because he'd had years of serial adultery. And so uh, we were separated and during that time I focused on my own healing. I focused on getting my relationship with God uh, on the way that it was initially supposed to be and really set God as um, the number one in my life again instead of my spouse. And while I was doing that, God was really humbling my husband. And I got out of the way and let God work on him. And it's been a little over four years now that we've been back together again. We have an incredible relationship. Our emotional intimacy is beyond what I could possibly imagine it would ever be. And it's because God really transformed both of us. And so I started Hope for Spouses to give other ladies out there, women who love God's word, who really want to be obedient to God, uh, the hope that, they, that, they can, that their life can really change. And there's no guarantee that our spouse will change, but we can change. And we can continue to lay our life before God. So in today's uh, video today, I wanted to talk a little bit about what can happen when, you know, when we first find out about uh, our spouse's uh, immorality or their um, porn use. They've been addicted to porn and it's maybe been going on for a while or you just found out. Where do you start? What do you do? Or if you've been on this road for a little while and you just feel like you're stuck, you know, you've got this huge obstacle in front of you and you just can't seem to get past it. So what are the steps that you have to do, the initial steps especially, that you have to take in order to really start healing? So who is this for? So for those of you who do feel helpless and hopeless, in other words, you know that the Bible has answers, but you have no idea where to start or how to take those scriptures and really apply them to your own healing. Number two, you maybe go to church or you did at one time, but you still feel lost, isolated, and alone. And it kind of makes you even feel more hopeless because church is where you should be able to get help. Uh, and number three, that you're at the end of your rope. I mean, you feel like a, sh a ship that's adrift, that's unmoored and untethered, and you don't feel like you're tied to anything safe. So if that's your, if that's your situation where you are right now, you're exactly where you need to be at this moment. And we're going to talk a little bit about that. So what is the first thing, the first step we need to really uh, take when we really want to start getting healthy in our own personal walk with God and find that peace that the scriptures say that passes understanding? So the first thing we have to do is we have to own our lostness. And you may think, well, what does that mean? <laughs> I know that I'm a mess, but um, just because we believe in God doesn't mean that we're necessarily right with him. Jesus talked about that in John 8, 31 through 32, uh, when he had the religious people come to him and he said, if you are really my disciples, uh, you will put what I say into practice. So it's super important that we're applying the scriptures. So part of being where we're at is really recognizing where am I? is owning where we are right now that yes i don't know what i'm doing i have no idea where i'm going uh, i may think i know the bible sort of well uh, i've been growing up going to church my whole life so i've read the bible but i don't know how to take it and apply it to my life in this particular situation and i think i know personally for me i had to i had to stop denying that there was something wrong with me I had to stop uh, denying that my husband was the main problem. And, and for me personally, my husband's sin uh, was the external problem. It brought out what was really going on on the inside. And it revealed things about my heart and my character, and especially about my relationship with God that I didn't even know was there. I, I think I, if I'm really honest and I go back and I really ponder it, I think I suspected it, but I didn't want to see it. 
I wanted to stay in denial. And I think that's one of the biggest things we have to get out of denying and making excuses for why we are the way that we are. We have to stop pretending that we know what we're doing. And uh, I kind of liken it to being in quicksand, you know, and you've ever, I've never been stuck in quicksand, but I've heard that if you fall into quicksand, you don't, you don't like thrash about, you like go still because the more you thrash, the more you sink. And I think sometimes we can feel like that in, in a marriage, we have a betrayed partner, especially when our partner uh, is not really repentant, the way it teaches in 2 Corinthians 7, 10 through 11. Um, but you can feel like you're sinking, like, like, you know, it's up to here and you're going to drown any minute. And I think we have to get to that point where we just, we, we stop flaying about and we throw up a flag of surrender and we basically say, my way is not working. Whatever I'm doing, it's not working. And I had to see how prideful I was and that the way that I was doing things was not God's way. And, and that it was the, a huge part of why I was stuck was because of my own sin, my pride and my idolatry and that I had put something in place of God. I had an affection for something that superseded my affection for God. And, um, you know, we can try to uh, answer our own prayers. You know, we can pray all these prayers and think that our solution is the answer to it. And I know that was not the case for me. Um, this, the, the path that God took me on for my recovery was never a path that I thought, like I was like, that would not be the way that I would go. And I felt like, you know, at some point I was, you know, dragged kicking and screaming toward that, but I had to finally just like surrender. I had to like recognize I am a complete mess and my way is not working and I have to figure out God's way. What does God want to teach me in this? And we're going to look in Mark chapter two and this is really where um, where Jesus was talking to um, some of the Pharisees. And it said, while Jesus was having dinner at Levi's house, many tax collectors and sinners were eating with him and his disciples. For there were many who followed him. When the teachers of the law, who were Pharisees, saw him eating with the sinners and tax collectors, they asked his disciples. Now notice they didn't ask Jesus. <laughs> they were too cowardly to do that. They asked his, his disciples, why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? But of course, Jesus heard them. On hearing it, Jesus said to them, it is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. Okay, so, you know, Jesus came to heal those who knew and accepted that they were sick. And that they were desperate. They were desperate for healing. And personally, I had to get to that point. I had to recognize God. I've got all these things that I've you know, been expecting you to do for me. And then this is the way you're going to solve my problem. Is you're going to fix my husband. Or I'm going to fix my husband. I'm going to do it this way. I'm going to do it this way. And I had to get to a point where it was like, I had to throw my, my ideas. I had to throw my plans out the window. And I think that's where God wants to bring all of us is like, he'll just stand there and wait until we exhaust ourselves because he's got a better plan. And I've shared, the, I shared this before. It reminds me of a cartoon of Bugs Bunny and Yosemite Sam. And that's, I grew up in that era where those cartoons were very popular. So, so Bugs Bunny is running from Yosemite Sam and Yosemite is chasing him, you know, like crazy. Sam's chasing him and Bugs stops and he puts his hand out and and he catches uh, Yosemite Sam right in the forehead. And he's just standing there holding Yosemite Sam. And Yosemite Sam's got his head down. And he's running, 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 running as fast as he can. And, but because Bugs is holding him, he's running in place. And he's you know, pretty much digging a hole in the ground underneath his... And every few seconds he stops, he's like <laughs> breathing. And then he keeps running. But he's not even realizing that he's standing still. And I thought that was such an example of my life as I was running in place and God was just gently and lovingly putting his hand on my forehead saying, are you done? Are you done? Are you done yet? And I had to get to a point where I was like, okay, my plan doesn't work. God, what's your plan? And I had to really surrender. I had to own my lostness. The second thing I did, had to do is I had to turn to God. Now, 
I had grown up going to church and I was in the ministry at multiple points in my life and I led different type leadership groups in the church. Uh, I did worship, you know, I, I did all of it. So, you know, the idea of me turning to God was like, duh, yeah, of course. But deep down in my heart, there was still a part of it that I, I kept. This was, my, this was my plan. And a lot of it was because of the way that I viewed God was off. So, you know, we can't focus what, you know, it's not about our wisdom. Okay, it's, we're not the one who's going to be able to solve this problem. And, and the way that you know if this is going on with you is you're still on the insanity loop. Things keep still coming back around. You know, you think your husband's going to change. You know, you think things are going to get better and then it goes right back to where it was. And it's like, it's, it just never ends. And, and what it really says is you haven't really surrendered this whole thing to God. You're still trying to figure it out yourself. And you're trying to push your agenda on God for your spouse or for your, you know, for both of you. And, you know, we keep thinking this is how God's supposed to work this out. And God, this is what I need you to do for me. You know, but God's ways aren't our ways. He says that in Isaiah 55 verses 8 and 9, that his ways are not our ways. The way that he thinks about things is not the way that we think about things. I want to go into a little bit of a story of a woman that we could probably relate to. Uh, it's We're going to read the whole passage, so it's going to take a few minutes to go through it. So just keep up with me, and I'll, we'll come back around and we'll explain some of these passages. So this is in John 4, the woman at the well. And it starts off now, Jesus had to go through Samaria, which was not a Jewish area. The Jews actually hated Samaria because they were half-breeds. So he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar, near the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about noon. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into town to buy food. Now this was kind of astonishing because Jews didn't talk to Samaritans, and men certainly didn't talk to women in public. So what was the woman's response? So the Samaritan woman said to him, you are a Jew and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? Because again, the Jews don't associate with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us the well and drank from it himself, as it also his sons and his, uh, his livestock? Jesus answered, Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I give him will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. He told her, Go call your husband and come back. I have no husband, she replied. Jesus said to her, You are right when you say you have no husband. The fact is you have had five husbands, and the man you now have is not your husband. What you have just said is quite true. Sir, the woman said, I can see that you are a prophet. Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain, but you Jews claim that the place we must worship is in Jerusalem. Woman, Jesus replied, believe me, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshippers will worship the Father in the spirit and in truth. For they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit, and his worshipers must worship in spirit and in truth. The woman said, I know that Messiah, called Christ, is coming. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. Then Jesus declared, I, the one speaking to you, am he. All right, so powerful passage. And I mean, every time I read this, I'm moved by it. And, and I really see this woman was trying to put on like she was religious. You know, she was like, yeah, I know what I'm doing. And here was Jesus, the Messiah. And she's trying to prove to him that that, you know, we have it together. 
And so, you know, in, in verse 10, Jesus kind of goes a little spiritual with her when he says, he starts talking about this living water, you know, and she's, she's just shallow. She's like, well, give me this water so I don't have to keep coming back to the well. So she doesn't understand what he's trying to say. And she keeps name dropping, well, our father Jacob. And so she keeps name dropping. And well, I, you know, and what sometimes that's what we can do. Well, I go to this church or I listen to this sermon or I do this or I do that. And we name drop trying to prove that what we're doing is, you know, is beneficial, is good. Like, you know, yeah, we got it together. And then in verse 15, you know, Jesus sees she's still not grasping it. And he tries to go deeper with her and he talks about, you know, what's the purpose of her life? And, and when, you know, she kind of keeps coming back and she's very shallow in the way that she approaches it, Jesus kind of, okay, he's like, okay, she's not, she's not really getting what I'm saying. And so Jesus asks her a very direct question and basically is like, go get your husband, like bring your husband here. And she's like, well, I don't have a husband. And he's like, you're right. And he, he says, you basically had five husbands and the man that you're living with now isn't even your husband. And now for nowadays, I mean, that would be kind of bad, but it wouldn't be, you know, like terrible. It'd just be like, you know, you'd be the, you know, probably the butt of a lot of gossip about it. But for back then, for a woman to live, to, first of all, to be married five times, like it would be either, either she was either widowed or they had divorced her for some reason. So talk about feeling worthless. And so that now she even has this fifth man who's agreed to live with her, but maybe he doesn't want to marry her because she's cursed. And so imagine the, the self-esteem of this woman, how low her self-esteem must have been at this point. And so, I mean, it's no wonder she's trying to you know, prove to Jesus that she has value, she has worth, because she doesn't see it in herself. Everybody in her life has basically told her that she's worthless. And so she feels no sense of that. I mean, there's not even any, like, she may have had children, but even her kids have not taken her in. So we don't know why this is, but we know that Jesus was trying to use her brokenness to wake her up to where she really was. And so, you know, she's still name dropping and this value association with, you know, well, I know when the Messiah comes and he's going to, and, you know, and Jesus finally just says, look, you know, I'm the person that you've been looking for all along. I'm right here. I'm the one you're talking to. I'm the one who can fill you up. I'm the one who can give you the value. I'm the one who can give you your identity back. And, you know, it's, it's, see, it's not about our religiosity. It's not about, you know, yes, we need church because we need the community. We need to hear God's word preached. But just because we go to church doesn't mean we're right with God. I mean, Jesus even said that to the religious people in Matthew 7, 21 through 23, he says, many will say to me, you know, uh, Lord, Lord, but he was like, you know, they done all these religious things, you know, they he did miracles and, you know, preached and prophesied and, and, you know, we do like worship and we do, you know, kingdom kids, we do the children's service or, you know, we do, we prophesy, but he says, away from me, I never knew you. And so I think we have to really get honest with ourselves. Are we really right with God? Have we really, really surrendered our life with God? Or are we expecting God, are we trying to dictate to God the way that we think he should be conducting our lives? All right, so it's really, we have to go really honest. I think we sometimes we have to just sit and meditate on that and get really honest with ourselves. Are we really right? Are we just pretending? Have we just kind of inherited our parents' faith? Or inherited, you know, kind of taken on like a, like a, a blanket, taken on the faith of our church? Or is it really our faith? Have we really surrendered to God? And because uh, the, the way that we can know we've done step one, that we've owned our lostness, and step two, that we are really, really um, surrendered to God, is that our life and our mind are transformed. And that's really step three is that we are transformed in our thinking. We're going to look in Romans 12 too, and this is really a motto scripture for this ministry. And he says, do not conform, this is Paul talking, 
Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Now, Paul was talking to the church in Rome, and this was a uh, Predominantly, it was Rome was a very non-Jewish community. It was there was a lot of gods, there was a lot of pagan worship, and and here there was these Christians who were claiming only one God, and so there was a lot. They were being majorly influenced by the society around them, and so Paul admonished them. He said, "Don't conform to the stuff that's going on around you. You have to be transformed the way that you think." by God's word, that God's word is the key to transforming what we think. And, and I think we have to always ask ourselves, if we are not changing, then then we're not thinking, um, then, I'm sorry, if we are not changing, then our thinking isn't being transformed. Like if, if there's not change in our life, there's there, there's not a change in the way that we conduct ourselves with people, with our spouse, with our kids, if, if our life is not changing, it's because we're not changing how we think. And if we're not changing, then the problem is not with God or his word. And we could be reading the scriptures, but if we're not changing, it's not God. It's not the scriptures. And we can sometimes get frustrated. Well, I'm doing this and I'm doing this and I'm doing this. And we can get bitter and angry at God. God, why aren't you changing this? Why aren't you doing it? It's not with God. There's something innately going on inside of us, maybe that we don't even recognize of what's going on. And really, if we're not if we're not changing, we need to go back and look at numbers one and two of what I just shared. We need to go back and relook at: Do I really own my lostness? You know, do I am I really right with God? And really questioning that because if we're not changing then we're living a powerless life. We are not living in accordance with the God spirit. If there's, ch if there's radical change not going on inside of our character, um, then, then something is innately wrong. And it doesn't mean we're not valued. It's just me it just means we've had our head down, running, 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 and God's waiting for us to pick our head up and look at him and look at him in the eyes and really see what he wants us to do, what he's calling us to. And, and I really want to um, compare our situation to somebody in the Bible that we would never think that we are like, but sometimes we can become just like him. And that was Judas. Now, in um, John 12, verses 4 through 6, now just giving us a little backstory, this is when Mary, um, the sister of Martha and Lazarus, came in and poured a pint of pure nard, which was a very expensive perfume, on Jesus' feet to anoint him. She recognized his kingship. And so she came in and she poured this perfume out to free on him. But it, and it says, but one of the disciples, Judas Iscariot, who was later to betray him, objected. Why wasn't this perfume sold and the money given to the poor? It was worth a year's wages. He did not say this because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. As keeper of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put into it. So here we have Judas, okay? Now, Judas had been with Jesus, walking with Jesus every day like the other 11 and many of the other disciples who followed Jesus. He had been with him for three years. But despite being around Jesus for three years, Judas never changed. Why? Because Judas had a different agenda than Jesus did. And like all the disciples, you can see, you know, this, this mindset of the Jews was that the Messiah to come was going to be, he was going to bring a physical kingdom and that he was going to conquer the Romans because that's who was ruling the Jews at the time. They had come in and conquered the Jews and taken over their land and, and the Jews were basically slaves. Um, not slaves in, in uh, like a vast group of them like that happened when they went to Babylon, but they might as well have been because, you know, they were living under Roman rule. And so they were of the mind, the majority of the Jews at the time, that the Messiah, when he came, was going to have a physical kingdom. He was going to be like David and he was going to conquer. And so that's what Judas was thinking. That's what all the disciples were thinking. But all the other disciples 
changed. Like they realized that what Jesus was, was bringing in was a very different kingdom than what they had anticipated. But Judas expected this from Jesus and, and this wasn't part of Jesus's plan. So Jesus, I mean, Judas didn't think that Jesus was worth what Mary had spent on him. You know, you think $35,000 a year. I mean, if we, if we bring that that um, expense of the perfume into modern day, you know, 35000 for a single bottle of perfume and she poured it on Jesus. Now, would a king be worth that? Yeah, we would say definitely a king would be worth way more of that. Well, Judas had been with them for three years. You know, you, so you would think very religious kind of guy. He was actually from the southern kingdom of Israel, closer to Bethlehem, closer to, you know, Jerusalem. And yet, uh, he didn't get it. You know, he, he was so set on what he thought Jesus was supposed to be in his life and in the world that he didn't think Jesus was worth the expense that Mary spent on him. And really, Judas thought of Jesus as a tool to bring about his own will. He wasn't into following Jesus's will or God's will. He had a will and he expected Jesus to do what he wanted him to do. So Jesus, see, Judas, Judas never actually loved Jesus. Judas fell in love with the life he thought Jesus could bring him. And when it didn't materialize, Judas became bitter and resentful of Jesus. And essentially, he refused to let his mind be transformed because he thought he knew better than Jesus. He thought his agenda was the right one. And like I said, all the other apostles, they changed. In fact, some of them were, were so convinced that Jesus was this kingdom of a, a, a higher kingdom, a king of a higher, they were so convinced that many of them died for their faith, but not Judas. So, I mean, and he had a chance to repent from his betrayal, but his pride drove him to self-destruction. So we have to ask ourselves this, okay? I mean, I had to look at my own life. You know, what was the agenda for my marriage? And, you know, I assumed uh, what I consider a life, uh, there's an author by the name of Sky Jathani, and he has a book called With. A fabulous book. I highly recommend that you read it. But he talks about the five different stances that we can have in our position with God. And the one stance that I really saw as my husband and I were separated and I was having to really, really reevaluate my relationship with God was that I had an attitude of life from God. That I did these things for God, you know, I served him, I did all these things, and then he was going to give me a good marriage. And he was going to give me well-behaved kids and healthy kids and kids who were going to grow up to love him. But <laughs> this isn't about life from God. God's not, as I shared last week, God's not a vending machine that we can, you know, put, some, put something in and then we get something out. And so we have to ask ourselves, who are we the most like? Are we like Judas? Do we have an agenda in our marriage? Do we have expectations from God in this life of God, I've done this, I've done this, I've done this. Why haven't you fixed my marriage yet? Why haven't you done this? And we really have to go deeper and really asking ourselves, are we really surrendered in our relationship with God? I mean, if you've called yourself a Christian or a disciple of Jesus, and, and you have not changed, you know, you, and you have not continued to change, something is wrong. I'm talking about deep character changes. You know, that, that this thing with your spouse is revealing deeper things. I mean, your marriage is short term. You know, you're, you're not going to be married forever. You know, there's no marriage in heaven. But God is calling us to be transformed in our character here, regardless of the choices of other people around us. We are still called by God to be different people, to be conformed to the image of Christ. And so if we are not changing from the inside out, something is wrong. Something is fundamentally wrong. You know, if, if this tragedy in your marriage is not driving you to be further transformed into the image of Christ, Something is very wrong. I mean, you got to go back and look at number one and two again, okay? Owning your lostness and, and really being surrendered to God. So once we start, you know, if we, if we get to that point, once we really start owning our lostness, um, allowing God to, um, or I'm sorry, is are we really 
surrendered to God, and then are we really being transformed in our thinking, then we can go on to steps four and five, which are pretty much, you know, implementing a biblical strategy for our healing, because our healing is not going to go forward until we're surrendered, until we've come out of denial. You know, we've got to surrender to God. So, you know, and there are, there are lots of programs out there. Um, some of them are secular programs and some are based on scripture. Uh, I recommend scriptural programs because they address the root issue of addiction and betrayal, which, which I personally be, believe and what the scriptures teach is our spiritual brokenness. That it goes back to that. Is when we're broken, everything gets off of track. Our spiritual brokenness, when our relationship with God is broken, then everything gets off of track. And so I believe it has to start with that. We can also have, we can go to a face-to-face -face group where we're sitting in a room with other people and we can do groups online. Face-to-face uh, -face groups are optimal because you really have that exchange of energy with other people in the room. You can really connect with people. But not all of us live in areas where uh, good programs are readily available. So sometimes we have to choose something that's online. And there are some groups that are compacted, you know, into like a long weekend. And some that take months or maybe even years. Um, but just be, I want to make you aware that I want you to, if you're going to do like a weekend group, like some of these intensives, I want to make sure that you go in with the right expectations. So we can't, we can't heal and transform a life's worth of bad habits, damaged thinking in a weekend. It, it, it doesn't, it doesn't happen. You know, um, you know, so don't, don't do an expensive weekend intensive expecting a miracle like boom your marriage is going to change overnight it doesn't happen that way so you know don't do it unless uh, and if you're going to do that go in with the expectation of this is going to simply be something that's going to reveal um, what's down deep something we maybe haven't seen in our marriage and then give us some steps to start moving forward but you know, don't do a week-long intensive or a weekend intensive or whatever unless they include a personal weekly follow-up uh, for an extended period of time. And because you, you know, just because you have the tools, you know, doesn't mean you're going to be able to make it. You know, when when Jesus in Matthew 28, 18 through 20, when Jesus um, left and he gave the Great Commission. He says, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And then he said, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. Okay. So in other words, we can't just convert somebody and walk away. That is not being obedient to Matthew 28. Okay. Our job is to teach them to obey everything in the scriptures. That we basically, they become our mini disciples and we're going to walk alongside them. So unless the programs that you're going are really have somebody that's going to walk alongside you to help guide you in this process, you're going to feel stranded. You're going to feel abandoned and you may end up becoming more bitter because of it. So you have to think of these programs as kickstarts for long-term healing. Uh, and then honestly, unless both you and your husband are fully on board, you're not dragging him along to go because you think this is going to fix your marriage. Unless both of you are fully on board, you're going to waste your money. So don't do it if it's just you that wants to make it. You know, if, if, if your husband's doing it grudgingly, he's not going to get anything out of it. Okay. It's got to be both of you on board for it. Now, there are also expensive programs that offer lots of personal guidance. And there are free ones that give you lots of good information, but no support. And so you're kind of left to figure out on your own um, what to do with all this information. So you have to really figure out what works for you. So don't believe, and this is really important, please, 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 don't believe anyone or any program that promises that they can heal your marriage. No one can promise that. No one can promise that. And it and only fuels confusion, disappointment, and bitterness when this program that you maybe have invested time in or money in or whatever, when it fails, because it will. So God never promised us a healed marriage. What he does promise us is his presence. Okay? Think about that. 
God never promised us when we became his disciples and we chose to follow him. He never promised us a wonderful life. In fact, just the opposite. In, in John 17, as Jesus was you know, giving out the last of his direction to his disciples, he was like, in this world, you're going to have trouble. It's going to be hard. I mean, living the life of a real Christian is the hardest thing you'll ever do. If you are really applying the scriptures every day to your life, you recognize this is the hardest life that you can ever live. Okay, so we were never promised that our marriage would just be, you know, roses. It, it, it doesn't work that way. What God does promise us is his presence. And he said, he never said that our husband wouldn't forsake us. What he said is that he would never forsake us. Again, Matthew 28, 20, Jesus said, I will be with you to the very end of the age. So we have to make sure we're resting on the right promises and not promises that we've made up in our head that are trying to fulfill our own agenda. Okay, number five to once we, you know, if we've done those, those three beginning steps and then we've, you know, found a biblical strategy to really start healing is we have to make sure we also find or we create a safe community. Now, I was fortunate. I was able to do both. So I found a safe community in Celebrate Recovery. I went there for about 18 months and actually did a 12-step program. It was awesome. But I also created a group from women in my church who were going through similar challenges in their marriages. And we got together for 18 months, and we met every week, uh, every Saturday for 18 months, and it was awesome. It was exactly what I needed. Now, one of the reasons we did that is because our church leaders didn't know what to do with us. So we turned to each, God, to each other, and we turned to God together, collectively, to really seek out what what do we need to do in order to really continue healing? Okay, so finding the right resources and creating a safe community, these take time. They take perseverance, they take personal motivation, and even then you don't know if what you join or what you create is really going to meet your deeper needs. You got to make sure that you've done steps one, two, and three before you can get into four and five. Okay, so if you have finally owned the depth of your lostness, and you're done pretending that you've got this recovery thing down. And if you're ready to turn to God on his terms and not your own, you're not you're like your agenda has not worked and you're finally facing that. And if you're ready to be transformed from the inside out, then I want you to go ahead and schedule a call with me, okay? And we'll talk about where you are. We'll get really honest, we'll get the Bible out. What you want, making and making sure that you're lining up your expectations with God's expectations and then how we can get you there and I'll share with you resources that can help you start your journey um, and if there's more resources like if I have particular resources that can help you we'll talk about that and we'll see if it's a good fit for you so if, if that is something you're interested in, then I want to encourage you to go to hopeforspouses.com slash call and go ahead and schedule this call and like I said we'll get on the phone for about 45 minutes We'll talk through your situation and we will get you some answers. Now, again, I don't promise it's going to fix everything and make everything peach keen. I don't promise it's going to fix your marriage. What I do promise is that you can have freedom, you can have victory, and you can have a life of peace because God promises it. But it's got to be God's way and not our way. Okay, so that concludes today's Lunchtime Live. Thank you for joining us. We will see you next week. Take care.